Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversation. It's a great, distinct pleasure for me to welcome to the program a major uh, archaeologist of our time, perhaps uh, uh, destined to be part of the pantheon of the great archaeologists in the history of human society, in my humble opinion. But that's Joel Grossman, and he's a, uh, an archaeologist, and he's had a very interesting career. And uh, we're going to be talking in some depth. In fact, we've been able to set aside two full hours of talking with this gentleman in terms of his work and his take on, uh, on, on, on the work and the implications of it, and also uh, some mentioning or thought about uh, where do we go from here and that sort of thing. But Joel, welcome so very, very, very much, much to Conversation. Thank you. I wonder if we can, in this series, we've talked with a number of people and what we find a, a way to get started, particularly since we've got a considerable amount of time, mm -hmm. two hours of time. Uh, I wonder maybe you could sh share uh, your own personal background, born and raised, born and, and raised. your early education and that sort of thing. <coughs> and then we'll talk into some of the important lessons to come out of the discipline of archaeology itself, and then also some of that place was in the larger consideration of the human condition. But sure. share your own background, born and raised, okay. if you could, please. I was born, I was actually born in Westchester, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. but then my father was in the military and oh. my mother happened to be close to family in Westchester. Mm -hmm. But then soon after the war, my parents moved to California, I so see. I was raised in Southern California. I see. In a rural community called Sun Valley, which is had at that time about 200 horses and about 400 people. Wow, that's pretty and good. And the horses were pretty sharp. I'll bet. Yeah. Sun Valley, there's Sun Valley, Idaho, too. Yeah, it was Sun Valley, Sun California. Valley. It was yeah. used to be in a in a canyon that was a cul-de-sac, and yeah. it was kind of isolated. Yeah. Now it's got a highway going straight through it. As everywhere, it seems. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, there was horses. I grew up with horses. You did? Would you have a horse or a pony I had of a your horse. Own? I had did you ride a horse? I rode a horse, and I participated in... Horse shows and gym cannas. Did you do do, do a massage or what do you call it? Where you no, jump that's over that's stuff? fancy English. Yeah. Uh, the you did more the, like a cowboy. Yeah, thing? More cowboy. Roy Rogers. More cowboy. Yeah. Uh, John Wayne type <laughs> thing. Yeah. Hardly, but no, uh, I would ride out of my corral uh -huh. and I could go into a mountain yeah. and not see the house for three days. Really? You, I mean, on your own, you'd sleep out under the stars? Right, and camp out. and. At least in Southern California, it's not real cold or anything. No, it was nice. Nicey but, uh, nights, yeah. So uh, we were fortunate. and. Um, You'd be, yeah, you'd be out there with your pony or your horse? Yeah, and uh, I was in the Boy Scouts. And the you Scouts, were a Boy Scout. Yeah. Scouts were very important for me. And they, oh, really? Yeah. A lot of the things I do in archaeology I learned originally in the Scouts. No fooling. Yeah. Really? You were, you were, you were a serious... Well, I was uh, an Eagle Scout. Did you Scout? become an Eagle Scout? You uh, became an Eagle Scout. That's Eagle really Scout. something. And you have merit badges. You have merit badges, and then they had a group called the Order of the Arrow. No. Which was even higher than an explorer. They had Weebawai or something. Uh, Weebawai or something. I don't know Did now. I was terrible that way myself. I became a Cub Scout, uh -huh. I think. There was a Cub Scout. I never could make it to Boy Scout. Uh. I got cashiered or something. I, uh. Yeah. But it sounds to me like you were, you, you, you learned to be thoughtful and take care of your lessons and you learned a lot of good interesting things for yeah, leading a, a productive life and from how, the Boy Scouts. Well, how to also camp. How to camp. How to camp. How to be out in the... Could you make a fire without matches? Uh, Rub two yeah, sticks together? I learned how to do Did that. Did you do that? Yeah, you? Noel was... I tried. I never could get the damn thing flint, to go. Uh, flint yeah. and uh, steel. Yeah. And you make sparks and you can... You probably could have survived in the back days of cavemen. And well, I don't me. know. We had a, I was in a survival course and they took us and they gave, gave us each a rock. Yes. And we had to carry that rock and it had a number on it and we had to come back with that big rock. What do you mean carry? Was it a, a couple of pounds? Or yeah, something? it was a big rock. You had yeah. to carry that thing around. Yeah, with they, yeah, they wanted to add to the trouble. Yeah. So we were bussed out or driven out into the desert, and we they spun us around a couple of times and said, no, just... You're on your own. You're on your own. No they, pony? No pony? They, nope. And they drove off. And, and you're, you're there in the middle of nowhere? You're supposed to know... Do you have a compass? Do you have a compass? You had a compass. Did they teach you how to use it? Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. And... Uh, 
They give you two sticks you could rub together to make a fire well, to I build a campfire. I probably had matches then. Did they have any uh, chocolate milk or anything? No chocolate no, milk, Carol. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're pushing the chocolate milk. I am. I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to get a, a, a thing for chocolate milk. I anyway, think the Scouts was uh, an important element in my education. Yeah, okay. Very uh, good. When I was very young, uh, my parents gave me a copy of the Golden Book of Archaeology. Really? Was that? Okay, I, I'm not familiar. Uh, well, yeah. it's yeah. a Golden Book series. I looked it up on the Internet. And yeah. I don't think they produced it, but they had yeah. the Golden Book of Dinosaurs oh, really? and the Golden Book, and it was oh, a really? little bit... Is this when you're nine, ten years old? Nine years old, yeah. Yeah, young, right, okay, young, yeah. and it yeah. had beautiful three-dimensional reconstructions yeah. of ancient cities. And were you, you were bitten then by, well, by the archaeological I was, bug? Well, yeah, I was interested. Or ancient so history. We yeah. lived in an orange orchard. Okay, yeah. And they had adobe soil uh -huh. that you make adobe bricks out of. Yeah, really. So what I would do with my Golden Book of Archaeology yeah. was to open it up to an ancient city right, and then try to make a model of that city out of adobe bricks. What a wonderful project. And you did that on your own? Uh, yeah, and it was only about two meters or six feet across. But I took a uh, cocktail ice cube trays. Uh -huh little square cup, yeah, right. little, and yeah. I filled them with adobe mud, yeah. and then I made ba Did you bricks. bake them? Bake them? No, I just yeah. let them sun dry. And sun dry. They would uh -huh. get, yeah. And you had little bricks to build a little building? And I built a little building. So You're very bricks. inventive, or very, uh, you know, entrepreneurial. Well, it say, became a, a, a foundation of, of later scientific work that yes, I did. Yes, I bet, yeah. Three-dimensional modeling. Yes, uh-huh. There's something we use to reconstruct past environments. R right you are. And yeah, so right. I use, and some of the articles I gave you had three-dimensional models. They of, did indeed, a lot uh, of them, yeah. Of, uh, of the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned that in the Scouts. Yeah. I learned that in competitions to make models. Yeah, and, and did you get, you seem to have gotten back home okay. From that well, I know, yeah, in the middle no. of the desert. That was funny. Everybody was going north by northeast, yeah. west, the stars. What do you mean? Ever others were left as yeah, well? Yeah, they were. Or the group? The, the, no, they were all. They, they were, were all individually, individually out there in the wilderness. Right. Wandering in the wilderness. Sounds S interesting. So as these guys. Survive. Yeah, well, these guys were going north, northeast, and the north star and the west star. I looked for the closest mountain, and ah. I walked to the mountain. And I climbed up the mountain. And, and they I, were never heard of again, maybe? No, they, no, they, they, got, they got back. back and I looked to where the city was, and yeah. then I walked back to the city. Well, you were able to orient uh, to the city. Yeah, I could see it. City I, kid. I could walk You were there. a city kid, right? Yeah. What so. was the family like, if I may? My mother was a New England Quaker. Uh-huh. And my father was an, an agnostic Hungarian a partial Jewish descent. He was not very religious. And I was raised in a Quaker meeting uh -huh. when I was a kid. Was he? Was there an intellectually stimulating environment? It was very. My mother was, was very yeah. educated. Learned, yeah. And she was an expert in Old German. Uh huh. And she was an expert in poetry. Uh huh. And right. I didn't have oh, old Nor poetry. I didn't have a TV until I got to New York after I g finished graduate school. Uh huh. Uh huh. And for a while. When I grew up, we had no TV, so I didn't know all the popular programs or characters that most people grew up with. Yeah. When I grew up, there was no TV. There was no TV. There was no TV at all. There was only radio. There was a little red light, and we had to green hornet and yeah, no, the this, radio programs. Yeah, no, this was their effort to, what we sh we'd do is she would read to us every night. Oh, boy. And my yeah. father would listen, and she would read. Jane Eyre, she yeah. would read a classical book. What a wonderful upbringing. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have brothers and sisters? I or? had a little sister who was mm -hmm. 10 years after me, so uh -huh, we were uh -huh. different ages. So uh, did you have a good dog spot or something? I, I mean, you have an ideal setting in certain ways. Yeah, we had, we had... Do you have a spot dog or a little we, cat or we something? We had... Uh, were there any animals in the barn? Was it rural? Or no, was it, no, it was, was semi-rural, like, and yeah. we had... Dogs and the dogs slept with the horses. Oh, they didn't and sleep with you? No, they didn't sleep with me. The mm. dogs were outdoor. Outdoor. And, and where I grew up, the animals were outside. 
So you were sort of rural. Kind of rural. It was a dirt road. Yeah. So next to a mountain, and I could ride right up into the mountain. But no television. How could you live without television? Yeah, well. How did we survive without television? (laughs) I don't know. I guess it mattered. When did you end schooling? Did you went to public school? I went to public school. Um, Nothing extraordinary. My parents didn't have a lot of money. Uh Uh-huh. I went to uh, junior high and high school near my home. In what was the, the town? In the San Fernando Valley. San Fernando Valley. Valley of Los Angeles. They got a song about San Fernando Valley. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah, right, uh, right, yeah. It's lovely first, weather. I mean, it's nice weather all the time. My first introduction to archaeology as yes, a kid. Yes, please, please. Uh-huh. As a kid was at this Quaker meeting I went uh-huh. to. Yeah. And one of the men in the meeting uh-huh. had found a skull, a human uh-huh. skull. Right. And he knew that I liked archaeology because I... You had I, already picked up on it? Uh, no, he brought me that skull, yeah. and I tried to reconstruct the skull. Yeah, but had you picked up on archaeology before they got that I skull, was, or did that uh, get no, you that I was way? What got you into archaeology at the beginning? Well, my father took Outside me to... Outside of intellectual curiosity. You no. had intellectual curiosity and a... Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, but I was fascinated with the me- the science of archaeology. Okay, yeah. The, or the, the reality of it. The reality of it and also it's it's like um, archaeology is detective work basically. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Detective work absolutely. and following clues. Mm-hmm. Anyway, my dad took me to hear and my mother took me to hear a famous Israeli archaeologist uh-huh. named Yagel Yadin. Okay. And he was a general. Uh-huh and the Near East, and he would read the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. the Old Testament, and follow the guidance of the Old Testament. We went 40 leagues to the Wadi. Uh So he would retrace uh, on the ground ground. and Uh find buried settlements. I'll be damned. Where the Bible said there was a settlement. Yeah. Now that well, doesn't. Well, where pre- was he stationed? And where did he live? In Israel. In Israel, he yeah. was reading, and in that Israel. was relating to it, and that intrigued you then. Well, or that was fascinating. I yeah. went up, but I, I. It I, nested with your training as a scout. As a scout, as but uh, he. I was under the impression that you had to be wealthy. You had to have a lot of money to be an archaeologist. Is that yeah. true? Or well, the, the reason I thought or that was, yeah. I thought, no, archaeologists wore pith helmets. Yeah. And I knew that a pith helmet was very expensive. So I thought the only way you could be an archaeologist if you were rich. Well, So I went up to this man and I... I wonder, I, that's a real interesting question. I've, I've wondered if the major people down through history were rich. No, no, no. No, I wonder. No, really, I don't think there were very many. That I, uh, but that's an interesting story that we can maybe get into later. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the idea of wealth and intellectual capability. Yeah, you know? I'm, I think the level of support has a lot to do with how much you, what you do later on in life. Well, that's, yeah. a, that's an interesting question we yeah. can deal with. Yeah. And this so I went up to this, this Yigel Yadin after his yeah. talk, a yeah, yeah. little kid. You, wait a minute, you, he was from Israel. Israel. He's living in where you are no, now. No, he was lecturing. In, uh, oh, he was lecturing there in the in town La- where you live. No, he, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. And how old are you now? Nine, Ten? nine years old. Nine. Nine years old, you're thinking. So okay. I went up to him, I said, Mr. Yadin. Yes. And he was a very tall man, he was about six feet three. He was mm. a huge guy. Mm-hmm. And I looked at him and I, <laughs> he, he said, yes. And I said, Mr. Yadin, how do you become an archaeologist? Wow, at nine you did. Yeah. And he you remember it? Oh, vividly. Yes. And he leaned over from up here yeah, down to here. Yes. And he said, little boy, yes. you go to school. <laughs> and that was a revelation. <laughs> you didn't have to be rich. Had you been, had you, oh, I see, right. Yeah, okay. You, all you had to do was go to school. And the school was there you could go to. I could go to school. Yeah. So, so you were a good student? As no, a I was a poor student. Were you a student. bit of an imp? Were you, I was were you a, athletic? No, I was. Uh, I spent my time with horses. Horses? Uh, horse riding. Well, you have to be athletic to yeah, ride a horse, don't you? Yeah, to a bit, yeah. Horses are very big. They kind of scare me. No, oh, well. They got big teeth? Yeah, they, uh, they, horses are wonderful animals. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I, I, I'm just saying my own lack there. Yeah. You know, yeah. So... That was my revelation as a kid, that you yeah. didn't have to be wealthy. 
Really? Well, you could wait, go wait, to wait, school. Wait, wait a minute, he, because he was not well? What no, made because you think? he said you go to school. You could go to become an archaeologist if you went to school. Okay, now what if you had said, what if you want to become a brain surgeon? You well, go to school. same if thing. If you want to become a lawyer, go to school. Yeah, right? but if but you... How did you get archaeology into your consciousness at a young age of nine? Usually you're thinking about baseball or Well, Beirut I had the Golden something. Book of Archaeology. Oh, okay, it was the book that did it. It was yeah. the book that set you off. Yeah, the book, I right? just tried to find it on the Internet. I, I read a book and the rest of History. Well, I would make these models yeah. in Adobe after the models in the Golden Book of Archaeology. Sounds like you would have been good with the Heath kit or something. Yeah. Did I you ever do a Heath kit? I did. Yeah, did I you ever get it to work? I had radios that worked, yeah. Yeah, but did they work after Yeah, you did? they worked. Does work. anybody in the audience remember a Heath kit? You have to be of a certain age. That's where you you could go to Sears and Roebuck and buy for $5 a radio, or you could order for $2 over there. They'd send all the parts to you, about 1,000 parts. you put them on a sheet like this, and if you put them very carefully together like that, you'd get yeah, a radio. Right. I never could make it work. <laughs> My friend next door used to always make it work, and there's a lesson in that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I congrats. Did you ever make a Heath kit? I made Radio Shack kits. Hey, radio, uh, yeah, you're, very, putting, you're good at putting things together uh, in a way good. that takes a certain discipline, pretty and it's good. a good lesson in learning. I'm good at uh, at putting hardware and software together right. in different ways yeah, that okay. hadn't been practiced. Yeah, yeah. So after my Yagel Yadin experience yes, and right. the idea of going to school, yes. which was a revelation to me. Yeah. I thought you, you hadn't liked school? No, that? I thought you had to be rich. Rich? What does that to be, to do? I, is that to be an archaeologist because they had a hippith helmet which cost a lot of money. Uh, so at that nine. Might, is that nine, the way people think at that, nine? That's yeah. what I thought. Okay, yeah, okay. And yeah. so... But you had archaeology in your mind at that young age. Yes, I did. Okay, good. And I yeah. made these models. And you were a good student at school? I was a... You listened to the teacher and I paid was a pretty attention good student. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't a great... Great A. I had. Did you get all A's? In no, it? I never got all Did A's. You ever, yeah. I struggled. You I, did? I had reading disabilities and I had trouble uh, spelling and uh, trouble with early spelling math. Spelling the English language, it doesn't make sense the way the English language is put yeah. together. I think you could have a much more reasonable way in which, like in Spanish, if you can say it, you can sp spell it. Right. Is that right? Is that yeah. true other languages? Do you know any other languages? Well, no, just Spanish. Just I speak Spanish. Spanish. You, if you know, if you can say the word in Spanish, you can spell it, can't mm -hmm. you? Without Pretty any much. Problem? Pretty in much. In English, they got all kinds of cockamamie yeah. Strange conjunctions words. and things like that. But you were stuck with English. So my intro, to get back to that, is my intro to archaeology. Yeah. <coughs> this man in the meeting, the Quaker meeting, yeah. found a skull. Found a skull. Gave me the skull yeah. to reconstruct. It was yeah. in pieces. Yeah. And I tried to glue it together, and it would come like that. Really? It would go like that. Yeah. It wouldn't come together. Well, maybe you were missing a couple of parts. No, it was distorted. It okay. had been... It, it was been, distorted? It, yeah, like by time. Like the thing they do with this? No, no, just the elements. The yeah. elements. Oh, the, from that. the elements. Okay, yeah. So I got on the bus in the San Fernando Valley, and I went over the foothills to yeah. UCLA. Right, well, that's pretty As a story. little little kid. Yeah. Are you 10 or 11 now or something? Yeah, I was... 10, 11, I was, no, I was in high school because that by the time I was in high school, I uh, started doing archaeology, and I'll tell that. you how. Yeah. So I went to UCLA with this broken skull. And this you're talking about when you were a young teenager? Uh, I mean. Young teenager, uh, about 15, I'd say. And I asked them, how do you glue a skull together? And at first they said, Go kid away, lost, kid, go yeah, away, right. we yeah. don't have time for this. Right, right. So I took the bus again, and I right. went again, Ooh, and I tried again. Determination. I had determination, yeah. and I went back over the foothills to Pain UCLA. Pain the really, to them, right? To well, after the yeah. third visit, yeah. they said, okay, right, sit kid, down. Sit down, yeah. We're going we're gonna to do something. You have perseverance. Gonna, I had perseverance, <laughs> and I must have been a pain in, a in, pain the, in the neck. Yeah, pain so. in the neck. Mm. Well, that got me in with the archaeologist yeah. at UCLA. Has that got anything to say about the nature of the archaeological mind? No, it has to do more with just bothering people till they let oh, you I in. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. But yeah, that's a it's more generalized. Principle. Yeah, the let you in the door. Archaeology. Right. Uh, so I I wanted to go to, a, to be an archaeologist, yeah. you have to go to a training camp. I would think there's a, a, training it's a whole discipline. A yeah. field school. Oh, really? In the beginning. 
to is, get a are job. Are you talking about a program at UCLA that at you got UCLA. involved in yes. as a 15-year-old? Yes. You were you were at UCLA at 15. No, I was at the summer. The summer I went to the. They let me go as a. I just. Adjunct. Uh, uh, they, no, they let me go uh, to uh, a hang out. Uh, to an archaeological field school. And hang out, but as not a, as a student. Uh, you I weren't a candidate for. I gra I graduated degree. from high school. Yeah. And then this went on for a couple of years, but mm -hmm. I graduated from high school, and then they let me enroll as an early student in the archaeological field I'll school. I'll be darned. No, really. So I was trained in the New Mexico. Four Corners region uh -huh, uh -huh. of Pueblo ruins. Right, right. And I learned how to excavate yeah. studying Pueblo peoples from the 12th century. And that was AD. as part of a program in archaeology at UCLA yeah, as a it. young man, a uh, relatively young man. And everybody. Younger had, than usual. Right? Younger than usual. Yeah, and uh -huh. everybody who wants to be an archaeologist should start early. Has right? to start at a field school. Really? You have Tell to me go why that is. Because you have to get basic training. Yeah, okay. Just like a doctor has to yeah, do residence. True. Yeah. You have to do a residence in archaeology okay. to get on an expedition. Okay. They'll say, did you go to a field school or have you worked in previous excavations? Okay, yeah. So by the time I was 16, I was on digs. You were going on digs with other supervisors. As a, as a low-level yeah, sure, yeah. member of the crew. Uh -huh. um, but it's connected with the university program? Well, it was connected to the state programs, state mostly. Okay. The, uh, the excavations in California <coughs> where I worked and I, I started out were by the state of, New of California. Okay, right, okay. And they yeah. were going to build a canal or something. Yeah, right. And then and the archaeology you know, yeah, the and they wanted to know it for for purposes of uh, well, was importance the to their project what the past had been. Well, and what, that was the, the law. There was the landscape. We do this because there are laws. Right. Okay. The if laws we don't if we don't have environmental yeah. laws yeah. or regulations that right. require it, yeah. people aren't going to do archaeology. Or pay attention to the to the past. Well, they're not going to the do it. Or patterns in place. They're not, this is a, the developers, yeah. the p private yeah, investors, right, right, right. are not going to pay attention unless they have to. They're not going to pay attention to the past. No. no, no artifacts By or. By and large, no. They're not. They're just going to be interested in the future earnings of their project. By and large. By and large. And that yeah. motivates most of society or a good deal of well, society. It, it, entrepreneurial society. Entrepreneurial society. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Well, okay. And, um, and the lessons of the past that are part of the grounding for archaeology are very, very important to understanding the human condition. In certain areas, I. Um, I meant as a general principle, a our general whole world society should be more interested in being making our peace with and understanding the implications of the past out of which we come. I think so. I do too. I think that there are lessons that we can only get from the past. Yeah, right. Uh, I started to mention there's an Army Intelligence yeah. report, and they criticized the United S the UN. Uh, environmental Agency, uh -huh. IPCC, yeah, International yeah. Panel Currently, of yeah. Climate. Yeah, they yeah. said there was not enough time depth uh -huh. in their work. They didn't go back far enough in time. Right. They didn't use history and archaeology right. to study climate and climate conditions in the 17th and 18th century. Is, can that be done by by shell by uh, what seeds and stuff or something? You can you yes. can get. You can get good readings of what the climate was hundreds of years ago. Absolutely, from you can. pollen, yes. From pollen counts and things and like that. And what archaeology does is creates a framework. Yeah, okay. The archaeology is the framework. Mm -hmm. And then you work with the specialist, the yeah. pollen specialist. Yeah. The archaeology creates a tree. Okay. Think of a tree without leaves. Okay. With branches. Right, right. On each branch is a different period. Yeah, oh, yeah so right. So you're going okay, up yeah. the tree, and yeah. there's 500 B.C., yeah. 100 B.C., yeah. 500 A.D., 1,000 A.D. Yeah. Okay. 1,500 and, and you just yeah. 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 That's what ideally an archaeological project tries to do, is to reconstruct the chronological framework. 
And a no. lot of these, uh, Mr. Ford, I think one time said history is bunk. Well, I don't you agree with him. No, I didn't either. <laughs> even though, uh, he, well, anyway, you know, I, nah, anyway, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Uh, that That's a beautiful metaphor, and it's really important. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. So I did a lot of history and geography, and it's sort of the same the same impetus mm -hmm. in thinking, I think, as the archaeologists. Yeah. Great respect for it, yeah. Anyway, so you were learning then in that. I was uh, learning. I, I, by the time I was 18, I was a supervisor. Wow, of a, of a crew? Of or? a crew, of an excavation crew. And what about academically, what was going on? I was you? an undergraduate. You were an undergraduate? Is that at UCLA? Or was no, at State College. I State went to State College for two years. At which place? At San Fernando Valley San State Fernando College. San Fernando, so The state's college system is good in California. And very good. Yeah, it is. And I didn't now. have the grades to get into Berkeley right away. Uh-huh. I had to... I had to go in, I had to get my grades up at State College. Uh -huh. Then I transferred to the University of California yeah. at Berkeley. Was that at the time? When was that been? What years? That was that was in sixty. I got my BA in sixty seven. My God, you were right in the middle of the summer of love and all I that, and the, the, the hippies and everything. I was buried in the museum most of the time, uh -huh. but I was. You weren't out. You weren't out there on the the sit-ins and everything. Not that was very also much. there was a thing raging in Vietnam. Were you politically involved or not? There was a great uh, stirring in the United States along about 1969-70. I don't yes. know where you were then. Well, I was at school. I was at Berkeley, and I saw at Berkeley. Well, that was the center of uh, K. You know, that was uh, Bob Dylan territory and all that. It yeah. was. Yeah. It was. Did yeah. you get involved in all of that, or were I you was involved in the politics? Was Vietnam then, wasn't it? It was yeah. anti-Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. And so I was raised as a Quaker. And oh, okay. And they are pacifists by yeah. and large. They yeah. And, uh, they they're don't wonderful people. Yeah. They're I think pacifists. of them as Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, they. I was raised in a traditional silent meeting. Over. There are two two branches of Quakers. Is that right? I didn't one, know. which is Richard Nixon, was yeah. a program meeting. He's one. Yeah, and they had ministers. Uh -huh. The traditional Quakers are non-programmed and uh -huh. didn't have ministers. Uh -huh. And the idea of the, the, they don't anymore, but they used to wear those flat hats. Yeah. The idea was to level yourself out in the eyes of God, uh -huh. that no man is superior uh, are closer to God than anybody else. And that was part of your ethical training? That was part of... Do you think it was? Family and also? Yeah. Right okay. Yeah. Well, that's important. We had missed that at the early stage yeah. of so your upbringing. So that, yeah. that, yeah. that tinted how I saw the war and, and the politics at the time. So uh -huh. I came from... The Quakers have a group called the American Friends Service Committee, yes, indeed. Yeah, indeed. which is very important yeah. philanthropy and, yeah. and public service. Mm -hmm. And so I went to camps of the American Friends Service Committee and did projects helping a community develop water or yeah, right, uh, doing right. something community yeah, something development. Something positive to help. Yeah. My father said something very important to me when I was young. He says, it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is that you do what helps people. That's interesting. That's a great ethic, yeah. Uh, yeah you right. do what helps people. Uh -huh. In other uh -huh. words, you have an obligation, whether you're a doctor mm -hmm. or a lawyer mm -hmm. or an archaeologist, uh -huh. to make sure that what you do benefits people outside of archaeology. That's a real good general principle, don't you think? I think it is. Yeah, really. Yeah. It's part of ethics, yeah. yeah. Right. You have to hey. have, I think it's important to have an ethical perspective Grounding. or framework Personally behind science because yeah. uh -huh. you have to deal with a lot of ethical issues. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. And I mentioned to you, we were chatting before about working with the Native Americans. Uh -huh. Well, that raises a whole bunch of ethical sure issues does. and hot button issues. Or, or, or Native people all over the world, for that all matter. Over we ought to have more take upon the world as one big general fa a whole general family of uh, human beings. Yeah, well, More that's, generally, I yeah. mean, I can only be effective. Away in from nationalism, or at least blind nationalism, yeah. I can only be effective in areas where I have studied, Peru. Okay. You so studied in Peru, as did I, as you uh, so, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I was in Bolivia, and, yeah. And then uh, the west coast of California, and then 
I moved to New York in 1970. Wait a minute, you had been at Berkeley? I was at Berkeley. And you did a doctorate there? I did my doctorate as a uh, Fulbright who, who Fellow. Who was your advisor? And, uh, John Rowe, who I don't was know a him. leader yeah. in Peruvian archaeology. Peruvian archaeology, yeah. really, yeah. And that was the story. Chicago was specialized in the Near East. Uh -huh. Harvard specialized, had very strong programs in the Maya area. Really? And yeah. Berkeley focused on... Peru, because really? early explorations were done by members of the faculty at Berkeley. Yeah, and you also didn't you also have some connection with the geographers there, Carl Sager? Sager yes, we did. Carl, uh, and uh, I, my program of training mixed Carl up, was mixed, a major up mix, mixed up what Carl Sawyer had to say with yeah. archaeology. Yeah, well, he was very interested in in the in the uh, non-Western plants. He wrote, he wrote plants. agricultural origins and dispersal, a major work yeah. in terms of understanding the human condition archaeologically. I mean, he sensitized us. Yeah. He sensitized people uh, to the importance of non-Western agriculture. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. And yeah. he promoted amaranth and quinoa uh -huh. as wonder seeds that had more vitamins and nutritional value than corn or even wheat. That's really interesting in and of itself. Uh, the the uh, quinoa would be associated with South America. Yes. That was, a, that was a thing that I was involved with there. I was there a couple of years at Lake Titicaca. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the making and the, and the domestication, as I read it anyway, of the four <coughs> major food complexes, at least... Um, outside of husbandry, and so forth, that made civilization possible about 10,000 years ago, we had, or within that frame of reference, uh, we, we had four different places where uh, the means by which you could, instead of hunting and gathering, mm -hmm. we were able to grow our own food by agriculture. We had wheat and barley in the West, rice in China, the maize or corn in Mesoamerica and the papa mm -hmm. or the potato mm -hmm. in uh, in Peru. Well, we had corn in North America too, but it was later. It was yeah. the earliest in. But Mexico. it was domesticated in uh, Mexico. Who was that guy that we used to? They used to have a guy there. Was McNeish. Was McNeish. Richard yes. McNeish. Did Scotty you know Richard? Ma yes, I did. He was a son of a gun. I he, loved him. He, he was, was just a kick-ass guy. You met him. I did. We met him. My wife and I. We drove down from Detroit in an old Pontiac car going to Bolivia, and we stopped in with him, and he <laughs> was really something. He, uh, Richard McNeish. It was yeah, wonderful. I was in, I was in northern Mexico. Uh, well, he was also working in Peru at a later time. Well, this was Mexico. This would have been 56 or so, I guess, something like that. Well, in the 70s, yeah. in the late 60s and 70s, he was working in Peru. Oh, well, yeah. So I met him. I was working about... Every uh, word, every second word was a swear word. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. He, was, he was a rough guy. He drank, I think, too. Well, Liquor. I'm sure he did. Yeah, right. He, mm. Wine, women, but he, and so Yeah, yeah. He was really a kick-ass guy. So uh, it was, sorry for that, but yeah. Yeah, and mm. he... Uh, loved he would, him. He uh, loved him. He was uh, really one funny. Yeah. memory of him was... Mm. In a bar yeah, one night, singles, singles, in yeah. a bar, and he had this jawbone, yeah, animal jawbone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he banged the bone on, yeah, the yeah. on the bar, mm. uh, on the bar, yeah. and said, "This bone is the oldest damn bone in Peru." <laughs> Bow. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You, so you had some dealings with that. I gentleman. had some dealings yeah, with him. Right. But Richard McNeish yeah, did a great critical guy. work yeah. on dating the antiquity of corn right. in the Andes Absolutely. and in Mexico. Absolutely. And his yeah. work was Andes. pivotal. I didn't associate it with the Andes. Yeah, he I didn't went, associate he, corn. He went down to Ayacucho, uh -huh. which is north of Cusco. Yeah, okay. Uh, he, he went you there. sure it wasn't disseminated from Mexico? I think it was domesticated. If he had he had the things from which the corn was domesticated. Yeah, yeah. It was a whole series of little tiny things that they grew. That they sente, to, uh, that's it. That's it. Exactly yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was a major trend. The two big exports from the New World was cor were corn and potato. Right. For the for the commerce of the of the planet. Carl Sawyer, you mentioned, promoted. I had the pleasure of having him in a seminar at well, Indiana a University. Guy. He was a beautiful guy, tremendously beautiful. I studied. Guy. I didn't work with him, but I studied his work mm -hmm. as a graduate student. Agricultural origins and dispersal was a major work. Yeah. And he was also instrumental 
in promoting non-Western grain. Okay. Grains that were like quinoa, yeah, quinoa in North America, which is a, the sister crop is called amaranth. Yeah, that's right. Amaranth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he established the nutritional value uh -huh. by studying the nutritional value of the amaranth uh -huh. and discovered that it was as nutri nutri nutritious as corn uh -huh. and even more nutritious oh, than wheat really, yeah. and it had riboflavins yeah. and it had vitamins yeah. that were good for your eyes mm. and it had all sorts of beneficial elements. One of the things with Carl Sawyer is I, as I understand, yeah. you, you, uh, I was really privileged to I guess be kind of I guess uh, I don't want to say young uh, it, uh, just, uh, Leading student or something. They they had me teaching at a course where the old professors. I was the only young guy as mm -hmm. a candidate. Mm -hmm. Used to go up to Chicago and fly and give courses and everything. Wow. But he came there to Indiana University. He was older then, and he had a seminar. I think there were three of us in this room with the man, and he had a pipe. And he was had a beard, if I remember. And he was exactly what a professor is supposed Look to be: wise and thoughtful and everything. Right. And we were able to have, uh, uh, you know, one on ones, one on ones in the in the room with him for a whole semester, wow. which is absolutely wonderful. He was there guy. studying the mound cultures of uh, Illinois or in something, Ohio? and that's why he had come to uh, to to Bloomington, you know, where I was doing the doctoral. That's work. where they found early wonderful. corn. Yeah, they found early corn, and yeah. with the Hopewell people. Is, is that right? Yeah. The Hopewell people. And yeah. He, he started a that whole That was a major tradition. break in terms of the human society when you got agriculture and you could produce your own food source. Absolutely. In conjunction with some husbandry of animals and so forth, but it made possible the beginnings of what was to become civilization. We are studying how that transition came about. Yes, sir. As I wouldn't, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say we really understand it. Well, no, we're learning. We're learning. Yeah. We're learning. And I'm saying uh, the world is learning at listening to this fellow named uh, um, Joel. <laughs> In my humble opinion, yeah. I've been going over your work. It's absolutely just uh, eye-poppingly good. Thank and you. And I congratulate you on it. We can get to that maybe. We have another hour. We can talk about it. Okay. But you've happy. done magnificent work in Thank contributing you. to that, and I congratulate you. I have. I think it's an obligation. No. A doctor is obliged to treat people and, and, and deal with health. Mm -hmm. uh, a scientist does science and an archaeologist does archaeology. What about all these politicians? Where do they come from? Well, is that from somewhere under the ocean or something? I don't no, know. No, I don't know where the politicians <laughs> came from. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm, that's, that's, that, we'll leave that up to the politicians mm -hmm. who study um, um, strange mm. diseases, yeah. Well, my my whole take on uh, the importance of archaeology, yes, you sir. mentioned that before. Um, I think archaeology is one of those sciences that has information that's immediately beneficial to current issues. Uh, you do? Okay. And, that's and sometimes and people have a hard time making that connection. And that connection. And do and make the connection here. Yeah. All right. And the mm -hmm. connection has to do, I started to say about this, Framework archaeology creates this tree, yeah, but it's naked. Mm -hmm. Then you study pollen and see what plants were at different periods, which begin to be leaves like, or something. No, and, branch, and no. you study the Bugs pollen, the you branch? study the seeds, seeds, okay. and you study the pollen, you study the seeds, yeah. and you have specialists yeah. identify the range of plants yeah. for each period. Right. So remember, we were 500 BC and yeah. then. Uh, 100 AD and yeah. then 500 AD, yeah. and so there's changes yeah. in the environment. Well, uh, yeah, right. What climate are change, yeah. climate changes? Mm -hmm. Well, changes in how people exploited the environment. Were able to either, you know, either. Yeah, they had to. Uh, they, 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 from my understanding, McNeish and other, they, they, they began. Or like well, einkorn and emmer were the type of wheat, I think, or barley up there in Europe and everything. But they began, it was very likely there had been all kinds of people making presumptions. It might have been women who did it, maybe discovered it more. Men were out trying to hunt down some big beast or something to bring meat home. I and can't the women, say. The women were gathering these grains and they had to get, and, and McNeish, he was drunk. 
<laughs> or something. But he was very, and he was talking about how the the precursors of what was to become maize mm -hmm. were tiny yes. little seeds, yes. and they had to they had to be uh, over time selected out. Mm -hmm. It was a selection process. Yeah. Is that correct, or is that what yeah, the ideology tells us? Yeah, pretty close. For this major thing, learning agriculture as a way of getting food supply. Yeah. And archaeology can tell us when and how that took place. Yes. Uh -huh. You can't explain <coughs> everything. No. But by contrasting things in different periods, yeah. you can see how the environment changed. You can see how the climate changed. Yeah. We can, can that be overread, do you think, climate change, historical climate change? It's a big question, isn't it? How well, much it climate change, to what degree... Is it relevant to major changes that came to be manifest in society? All I know is that in the past, I mean, is it set, it's not settled science, is it's it? It's not settled science. I mean, it, and it's still ra it's still a big issue today with climate. Uh, it's settled. It's settled in the scientific community, yeah, yeah. not in the brains of the politicians. Yeah. Okay. Not in the new administration we have. Oh no! No. I well, mean, that, they are that, attacking that's, scientists. That's anybody kind of special? Yeah. Anybody that in supports environmental studies or in supports uh, the idea that there's a, a a climate change taking place today yeah. uh, with the warming, global warming. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a condition that we have never faced in the past. Yeah. What we see in the past are cycles. Okay, yeah. Cycles, right. Yeah. all right? Just think of well, a cycle. Well, maybe we're in a cycle now. Well, maybe matter. we're maybe, in a cycle, yeah. but it gets rough. Yeah. Because in cycles, it can be damp, then it can be dry. Yeah, right. It can be damp can be dry. Right. These are normal cycles, yeah. and the archaeology can identify yes, these, these and droughts. Right. And they have. And they have. And the archaeology identifies the droughts mm -hmm. and identifies areas of weakness, of, 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 of wetness, mm -hmm. and <coughs> periods of wetness. Mm -hmm. And what is happening now is that the environment is changing on top of these cycles. Uh, See, we have these yeah, long-term cycles roll and change in the because of the, of the hydrocarbons and yeah. because of the coal burning. Well, mankind's role in changing the face of the world. Once we discovered this power to make these changes over things, it gave us a real strong hand over everything in terms of the, the way the planets operate. Yes. Yeah, inordinately so and growing all the time. That's true. And, and in order to understand that current situation that we're in, it's good if we could get uh, back to the roots of how we got here. Yeah. And that's called, what is it? It's called archaeology. Archaeology. It's yeah. a very, it's a very noble. Uh, it's the study of men. And it, and, it, and it links in with geography and mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave you that article on landscape. Did you yeah. You see that landscape article I sent you? Yeah, and I've seen a lot of it, yeah. but you, you, the thing is it was also good. <laughs> the writing was so good. Good, thank you. And it's very, very carefully done and everything like that. Well, that writing was special because it was done uh, for an encyclopedia out of London. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The British Encyclopedia of Archaeology, which is... Is, is that a major journal? A major where book. Are the major, where, are the major, where are the major tomes, let's say? That do it. But I want to say one thing with Sauer, Car yeah. Carl Sauer. Sure. He, he wrote Agricultural Origins and Dispersal Major. Thing. And if I understand his take on it, and I was in on that room with the man, and mm -hmm. we were talking mm -hmm. about things and everything, he had the understanding that, uh, uh, as I understood it, um, we're, we're talking about four different places where there was this development. Yes. And was it an independent development in those four places? Yes. Or was it the idea of, of you can put, you can grow your own food, no. develop one place, and then disseminate it by people? That knowledge were disseminated. And we I don't thought know. He was, I thought he was uh, giving very secure. He thought there was maybe one place, maybe Southeast Asia or something, where it developed the idea, yeah. and it was disseminated outward from there. He I was talking at a time, Harold. Yeah. He was talking at a time when people believed that the Peruvians were influenced by the people in Asia. That boats were coming across the Pacific and populating and giving ideas 
to people in South America. Well, I don't know how he got it down there to That the was a popular, the Contiki, remember Contiki? Contiki, I remember oh, that. Yeah. Well, that was yeah, part yeah. of that whole yeah. myth yeah. about people coming from Asia. And it wasn't the Indians in Peru that invented it. It was smarter people in Asia. Well, no, but that was a... Yeah, that's but, what people... But that's, he was a smart man. And oh, I, yeah. And he seemed to be one who thought that it was discovered in one... The idea. No, I understand what and you're so saying. what do you think? How, you're an archaeologist yeah. and you've studied the whole thing. I think Where that did the idea... Did it occur to a couple of people on a campfire somewhere in the world and they went out and carried the thing like Johnny Appleseed to the whole world... Or was it discovered independently? I always thought it was discovered independently, maybe in four general areas yeah, of well that's agriculture. A, a, a what, is it, what is the archaeological record, according to uh, Joel, say? Well, well it, your understanding it, it, it of varies. It's a major transformation that made civilization possible. We studied that, yeah. and I excavated a 3,000-year sequence up in upstate New York. I know, well, you did, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Where a prehistoric... So where it was 1500 BC. Uh, 1500 BC. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, where, uh, where was it located? Fort Edward, New York. I don't know where. Where is that? Well, that's uh, Glens Fall. Fort Edward is the head of the Hudson River. Okay. The top but of the Hudson River. Well, how did you happen to come upon that place as a place to be looking at? Well, they started construction on yeah. a major federal project. Okay, this is getting into a lot of work you do. Yeah, you and they the hit. Who are dealing with the build environment as it's growing now? They hit yeah. human burials. Uh huh. And they hit human burials, and the project was being funded by the U.S. EPA. Okay, Environmental Protection Agency. And they had strict laws that required that they did justice to the archaeology if it became a problem. Have those come in recently, those kind of laws from the political class? Well, those give some uh, those cover came to the archaeological? Those assumption? came in in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, that was part of the uh, Kennedy. Kennedy. Or a time of some enlightenment. Some of the, yeah, well, some of them are executive orders from Nixon, of all people. No, okay. Very well, practical, practical stuff. Things grow that way, don't they? I mean, things don't, okay, yeah, but anyway. You, you Yours, know, yeah. yeah, the... <coughs> history in general, historiography is another thing. It goes right with archaeology, doesn't it? Historiography. Trying to understand the whole story of the evolution of human culture yeah is a larger issue well one of the things we're trying to do is date when corn came in very well, we simple can, questions yeah yeah when did corn become visible can we do that better now with carbon dating and yes so we can and, 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 and i when just when did that come in incidentally well the carbon dating was experimental in the 50s and 60s is there potassium argon or something that's is for, a different system that's a different system for much older Rocks. They're both useful, though, in terms of dating archaeology. But yes, yeah. well, the potassium argon was used to date early man in Africa. Oh, really? Radiocarbon. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. radiocarbon was used, it only goes back 30,000 years yeah. or so. Yeah. And then the radiocarbon peters out. Okay, okay. And you need other systems that okay. have longer half lives. But those are both collectively giving us a better handle or method for getting at the truth of what the reality was and is. Well, they, g they date We're the events. Yeah, better. They date Didn't the they've events. they've ever had, say, 100, 200 years ago. Well, now we're getting to the point where we can date within a generation. Wow, that's really something. So we're, I got dates that were 3,000 years old, plus or minus 15 years. My God, really? Plus or minus 15 what years. Is that, a, is that carbon or what? Radiocarbon, Radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating. Yeah. And I use a new technique called accelerator mass spectrometry. Okay, that's a big word. The accelerator yeah. mass spectrometry. Is that's that characteristic of the archaeological uh, endeavor now? Well, it, it's... generalized it, use? It's the ideal. Yeah, okay. You want... To, it's ideal. It's much more accurate in much more specific in time uh -huh. because we used to have plus or minus 300 years yeah, right, or right, plus right. or minus 100 this years. years. This yeah. is 15 years. Yeah, this yeah. is getting down to a generation. Yeah. Yeah. And so what yeah. we do as archaeologists is yeah. we tell the other sciences mm -hmm. what the chronological framework is, mm -hmm. what the antiquity of different cultures are. Mm -hmm. And then we study the pollen and the seeds from these different time periods mm -hmm. to reconstruct environment. Uh -huh. okay. So yeah. that uh, 
of this recovery and study of ancient seeds mm -hmm. is part and parcel of what we do in archaeology. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, sure. And yeah. so that's why we study people like Carl Sauer uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, his 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 team at uh, in the Midwest. Well, he he was at uh, at at, sir, at, uh, at uh, uh, Berkeley, yeah. Yeah, he was yeah, at Berkeley. Berkeley. He was on leave for when he came. He was getting older. Yeah. When he was there in Indiana with us. And right. But he was he was an extremely wise, beautiful man. He had a pipe. <laughs> you know, like he smoked a pipe, like a professor's supposed to do. You know. I used to smoke a pipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you should it? maybe you, you know you have one. You can get no, a no, old pipe. I, you, I'd you, stop you, smoking. Oh, it might be a good script. You know, yeah. it might be a good uh, what do you call it? What prop. do you call it when you got a prop, a prop on yeah. a television program? You could uh. have a pipe, <laughs> and if you drew a beard, if you grew a beard, you know, like that. I had a smoke. beard. I had you long just, hair and a yeah. beard. You did. Yeah, you saw that picture in Peru, right? Yeah, that's. Oh, that looked like that looked like uh, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. He was dressed up like Indiana Jones, but he's real. Yeah. That was at near Cusco. That right? was in, I was lost in the Andes. People say, "What are you? What were you doing?" I said, "I was lost." You were doing serious archaeology. Oh, I was work. serious. That was serious. I was you had that thing. That thing went down. You had the bones. The the, the bone. The, Burials. The, yeah. yeah. It was you. It was real serious. And your work is just really is really amazing. You could go on for everything like that. But anyway, so the dating system's becoming back. Everything's growing, archaeological capability to get it. We're getting a better picture all the time of the evolution of uh, Homo we're getting sapien culture writ large on this planet. We're, we're getting, getting a better understanding of what's going on. I uh, would Alfie. say so. I think we're getting more precise. More precise. In our age and time differences. And are we getting more accurate in the accuracy, the actual... Absolutely. Ex 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 uh, exhibited accuracy in future men's ways of measuring that instead of the guesses we had to do out of history. You right, know what I mean? right. It's getting more accurate. Much than more accurate. And we don't is. guess too much. We, we don't have to guess as no, much. No, right? no. Yeah. But we have major gaps. We do have some major gaps, particularly when we're guessing in some new sort of policy or political context for the planet. Yeah. I think we're lacking in that. Overall arching uh, principles by which we're going to organize things. That's another issue, isn't it? That's, That's a whole different topic, yeah. yeah. Um, beyond my pay scale. Yeah, pay, or the economic, it gets into the economics and the politics and all that kind of thing. And well, I study prehistoric economics. Yeah, you do? Yes. Well, that's interesting. <coughs> that's a major area of my in interest. In Peru, I studied, I found a 3,000-year sequence. Yeah, you said. Uh, yeah. Both in north and upstate New York. I started to tell you about upstate New York yeah, right, and in Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, in the upstate New York case, the archaeologists that were working at this site Mm -hmm. Hit burials, yeah. Native American burials, yeah. but tried to keep it a secret. Why? They didn't want to deal with the, the Native Americans. They didn't want to deal with the Indians. They didn't want to be interrupted. They thought that they well, would. They, well, they, did they have a project, a building project? They, they wanted were, to get on with the dam were, or something? Or they something? were building uh, a, a, water, a water treatment and plant. And they had uh, built in uh, return ratios for investments that they had to live up to and so forth. And well, these are federal secret. projects, so they have a set budget. Well, yeah, but they do. Well, they have a set budget. Set budget. They also have an economic thing to have a successful outcome, even if some of it's being from the government or not. But the investment bankers have the same kind of mentality. Yeah. They want to get on with the project. The bottom line is they can't go ahead with them. If it's a federal project yeah. or a federally permitted project, yeah. they can't go ahead with the project unless they do justice to the archaeology. Well, they that, have that's to some new thing that's been coming in from certain quarters of our society intellectual or otherwise, that has gotten in the way of the devil-may-care kind of attitude of your m entrepreneur who says, to hell with history as a bunk. I want to get on with my project. I've got investors I have to get Sometimes. a return to. Sometimes. And I want to build something, and I can make a lot of money at this. And that's the sort of thing that seems to be... Um, very much uppermost in much of our political decision making. Yeah, but there are also there are good Damn guys. Damn the history. No, there are good guys in the private sector too. Smart developers. Yeah. Smart developers. I'm trying to make it more in general the the thing because the entrepreneurial you could blame the entrepreneurial attention of the private sector if you want, 
But you've also got people very ambitious with their own kind of things within the private sector, I mean, the public sector, who've got po projects they want to get out with. they got Abs another war to fight Absolutely. or something, and they're in the public sector. Well, that was so like you got the enough guilt to go around to both public and private sector of our leadership. Yeah. And they ought to be informed by our archaeologists and other scholars. More well, they, 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 the archaeologists come in if there's a law. <laughs> yes, I know. There has to be a law. Yeah, right. Yeah. There has to be and a that regulation. that has come up through time, right? Well, that's been developed since the 60s. And 60, well, that's just yesterday. Yeah, I know. I mean, very recent. The, the, na the history of the nation, much yeah. as the history of the species. And the laws are very simple, that if you are going to disturb an archaeological site mm -hmm. that's of national significance. Yeah, but who, who decides what's national well, significance? Well, the archaeologists. Old bones don't No, count. the archaeologists. thinking when you got a profit margin to gain. Yeah, well, uh, you're, you're egging you me on here. You know what I'm here. saying? Yeah, but I, I you do. Have to, you have to deal with that, don't you? You have to deal with it, yeah. but you have to deal with the regulations as well. And All if, right, yeah. If the regulations say you have to do justice to the archaeology, mm -hmm. you can't keep the burials a secret. You have to report them. And let's see if you can keep it a secret long enough. You can get the project up, and then well, it's done. Yeah. And once it's done, they're not going to do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, but that's uh, again got a fifty-story building that they're building on. And yeah, but this is a. You understand what I'm saying? Sure, but this yeah. is a federal project. Uh huh. In uh -huh. New York, it's the, under the Landmarks Commission. Uh -huh. They uh -huh. have jurisdiction. It varies state to state. It varies from state and city. Who, where is the best uh, <coughs> guardians of the uh, archaeological or the historical context of the human condition to be found? In the private sector sources or in public in sector sources? In public sector. Public sector in sources. Public you think sector. they ought to be encouraged by that, Absolutely. Right? Uh-huh. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, it's really, it's really, that's just getting us up to the present in a very real sense. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with you is, uh, you got a lot of troubles, though, you know? You know, first <laughs> of all, uh, you know, you're too damned interesting. If you could just calm down a little bit and become a little more boring and talk <laughs> about mm -hmm. something, you know, like uh, the sale at Macy's or something like that that would have meaning or something, it would be a lot easier to conduct these things. But you're too damned, you can try to gear down a little bit, mm -hmm. and maybe you can do that on a second program we're going to have. Sure. We've come to the end of an hour, so we're going to have to say goodbye to the audience okay. and everything, and let's make sure we get the link to his website and everything. And we're talking with Mr. Joel, Dr. Joel Grossman, as you can see, a very, very interesting and wonderful citizen of, of Spatial Earth. Happy to have been able to bring you this, um, the beginning program of two. We're going to have another program with him uh, following this one. So we invite you to tune in at that time. And Joel, thanks a lot for such a Thank you. very well-led life. And we're going to see if we can't uh, elucidate more on the, some of these ages after you were a Boy Scout and just first learning your lessons in sure. California. Sure. Thank you for viewing. We'll be, uh, we'll be coming back with more uh, in a second program to this one. Uh, so do look for that in the day or so ahead. And Joel, once again, uh, stay put. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Don't move anywhere. You're coming up for a second program momentarily. Okay. Thank you very, very much for that. And uh, we'll be coming back uh, tomorrow with another program. Thank you very much for tuning in. Okay, are you ready for another hour? Can you sure, have it? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's very interesting. I want to make sure. Let me go out. What do you want? you want some chocolate milk? No, no, you no, chocolate no, milk. no chocolate milk. No chocolate milk. No chocolate milk. I'd like to uh, fill up my water bottle okay, at the water fountain. Okay, Oh, I have my 